Hello everyone and welcome back to another dinosaur documentary review. Last time we covered Dinosaur Planet and man you guys came out to see it. That's awesome. Now we move on back to T and Crumpet Land for The Truth About Killer Dinosaurs. This two part dino doc came out in 2005 on the BBC. Part 1 analyzes the strengths and weaknesses of both T-Rex and Triceratops to see who would come out on top. Part 2 shows us Velociraptor to question what it was truly capable of. The goal here is to dispel common dinosaur misconceptions and see which ideas actually hold up. Kinda like a Paleo Mythbusters, which would be a really cool idea for a full on series. Soon we'll see that this show does a very good job at this. Not perfect of course, but we'll see exactly how accurate it is. Before we get started, I want to point out that I'll be skipping the second Jack Horner fake news dump, T-Rex, Warrior, or Wimp, because it deals with most of the same points we debunked before. So go watch my Valley of the T-Rex review for more on that nonsense. With that out of the way, let's dig this up. Okay guys, I don't know how many of you are big fans of killer dinosaurs, but I think it's alright. That is, from a purely artistic standpoint. This is the first good example we've come across of those vastly over-edited shows that cause a mini headache. Certainly not as bad as some others down the line though. I'm also not a big fan of the host, Bill Oddie. He has this over-the-top way of presenting that gets a little annoying. And also, the scope is very small, focusing primarily on predation and defense from predation. There's much more to dinosaur lives than just eating things or fighting things trying to eat you. Overall, I still enjoyed it though, but as promised, none of this matters to the rank. Scientific accuracy is the only factor in the grading process. I only wanted to rant a little. When it comes to solely accuracy, the truth about killer dinosaurs is great. I'm actually blown away by how much the creators got right. So much of it holds up 16 years later. One place where it succeeds is with the size estimates. Tyrannosaurus is correctly placed at 40 feet long and 12 feet tall at the hips. Yeah, some specimens can grow even larger, but this was a more typical adult size. They couldn't all be Sigma Chad Scotty. Velociraptor 2 is given a rightfully small turkey size as it would have had in real life. The height is stated at 2.5 feet, which is an exaggeration of the under 2 feet animal, but it looks decently sized compared to Adi. We don't get size estimates for any other subjects, but by comparison, they all look about right. Most dino designs here may not be perfect, but they are still really good. The BBC is improving for sure. <laughs> I thought you were sick. I got better. For the first time in forever, raptors are shown with contour feathers and actual wings. It is accomplished. They obviously couldn't fly, but several uses have been suggested by researchers like for steering while running, which is shown, helping while climbing, and balancing while pinning down prey. Maybe all of these? Who knows? We do know that the wing feathers are actually extended down the middle finger and fluff would have gone past the eyes down to the snout. But aside from that, it's looking good. Plenty of comparisons are made between them and birds such as having floof, the presence of a wishbone, and having hollow bones. I appreciate this dino doc's portrayal of Triceratops. All too often, you see them with small spikes bordering the frill. These only occurred in younger individuals, shrinking as the animal aged. Adult trikes had those nice, smooth frills we see here. Plus the horns look about correct in shape and size for T. Horridus, which had more forward-facing brow horns and a shorter nose horn than the later species T. Prorsis. It also has the correct leg posture, with the back legs going straight down from the body like in other dinos, but the front legs are splayed outwards. Nice attention to detail. In the Mongolian segment comes an unnamed ankylosaur. Due to the time, place, and size, we're probably looking at Pinacosaurus. Too bad we don't get a generic name to be sure. Who am I? You sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. Anyway, I love the way the osteoderms are arranged. We don't get that centipede looking shell we see all too often. Nah, we get those nice rows of armor that make me not want to off myself. 
The Dino Doc also rightfully tells how that classic club was made by the fusion of caudal vertebrae and enlarged osteoderms. This is called a synsacrum complex, found in ankylosaurids. Not those notosaurids, though. And of course, I gotta give credit to the inward facing wrists on the Rex and Raptor. I hope I never have to see pronation again. Oh. Unfortunately, we don't get this on the Ceratopsians, but at this point, I'll take whatever I can get. Okay, okay, I fangirled enough over their looks. I mean, looks are all that matter, right? Like I said before, the truth about killer dinosaurs accurately dispels dinosaur myths. In large part, we can thank several paleontological consultants, like Ankylosaur King Ken Carpenter, for their input, and thank the writers for taking this input into consideration instead of tossing it aside for the sake of awesomeness like many other dino docs. Instead of running in like it was jousting, Triceratops would have been better doing more fencing, facing an attacker, and shoving with their horns. I don't want to use circular reasoning by saying the show was right, because the show said so. However, the methodology they used for this experiment seemed correct, so I won't complain there. Velociraptors and their Dromaeosaur brethren, using their sickle claws to slash open their prey, is a trope we see all too often, even in documentaries, but also couldn't happen. Yeah, these were pointy weapons, but the underside isn't sharp enough to slice through flesh. On the other side of things, the idea of Tyrannosaurus having a super strong bite, this is actually supported. This dino dock gives an estimate of 8,000 pounds per square inch. Over the years, estimates have ranged from 6,000 to 12,000 pounds, but 8,000 is the usual number that gets tossed around. Unfortunately, we don't have actual T-Rexes with us to measure, but by scaling up the bites of their distant Archosaurian relatives, we get some idea of just how powerful they were. But I guess they're only scavengers. <laughs> nah, not even long after Jack Horner's paleo mockeries, Audi shows us direct fossil evidence of Tyrannosaurus predation. Their great eyesight is also accurately highlighted, as they would have had binocular vision that rivaled modern birds of prey. It is also likely that the Tyrant Lizard King had a skull full of lumps and bumps around the eyes. These keratinous facial coverings have been found on the skull of Daspletosaurus horneri, so it's possible they would have been on T-Rex as well. We get a bit of that here, before this idea even came to light, although it may have been more pronounced. And spoiler alert, ankylosaurids were capable of shattering bones, no surprise there. This documentary also gets the environments correctly. Our host compares the environment of the Florida Everglades with that in which T-Rex would have lived, which makes sense. The Maastrichtian formations in which it and Triceratops are found are subtropical floodplains carved out by rivers and deltas. Then we see the Jaducta formation in part 2 as a sandy, semi-arid environment. And the final compliment I want to give is to that ending. Adi pulls out a Mega Raptor Claw and concludes the documentary by noting how much our perception of dinosaurs has changed and how much it will change, that there are still many new discoveries to be made. It's an encouraging note to end on as it inspires us to look towards the future and make radical new finds. Although I have a lot to compliment, there are still a few shortcomings and information that doesn't hold up today. A lot of the outdated and problem sections will be fairly nitpicky. This is only because the truth about killer dinosaurs didn't make so many obvious mistakes that they take up all my time. Since they got a lot right, I have to dig deep to get these shortcomings. The first to stick out is the running speed of Tyrannosaurus. Here it's depicted as being able to reach 25 miles per hour. This is a weird one because even the paleontological consultant was like, yeah, 25 is pushing it. But Bill Adi thought that liberal estimate sounded so cool he had to go with it. He sides with the Green Party, so it makes sense. More recent estimates range in the teens since if a Rex were to go any faster, it would have broken its legs. Oh, my leg! My leg! But to be fair, it's still accurately depicted as an ambush predator. Oh, and I can't forget the lips. Most theropod dinosaurs would have covered their teeth with lips. It's shown roaring too, which dinosaurs probably couldn't do. Modern archosaurs can make hisses, bellows, and booms, but nothing this mammalian. Another minor nitpick is how we see Triceratops horridus at the very end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago. 
the species came slightly earlier with T. Porcis making it to the extinction event. It's likely that Porcis evolved from Horridus, but at the time the stratigraphic distinctions weren't made, although both species were already known. In fact, it was even considered that the two species represented male and female variants, but we know now that wasn't the case. Another recent discovery I should point out is of their skin. Not to be racist, the Triceratops here is shown with round, non-overlapping scales, like you'd expect to see in a Ceratopsian. They look pretty generic, basic like a teenage girl at Starbucks listening to King George's song. New finds of Triceratops skin impressions revealed that we got it all wrong. These guys actually had large, bumpy scales with big projections that can only be described as tough nipples, my nickname in high school. To think that Triceratops wasn't already cool enough. T-Rex is given similar generic looking skills too, when skin impressions from it and other Tyrannosaurids show that they had these relatively tiny scales, giving their skin a more leathery look. Now for the Velociraptors, we already discussed how they couldn't use their sickle claws for disembowelment. Well, the hypothesis presented in the show is that instead, they used these claws to stab at the neck, puncturing the vitals of their prey. Yeah, I guess this is possible. The fighting dinosaur seems to show this behavior, but it's also possible that the raptor was just kicking the protoceratops in a desperate attempt to break free. The behaviors of extinct animals are always hard to figure out. We can't get overzealous and jump to definitive conclusions. Now it seems a different method of attack is also supported by the scientific community. That being raptor prey restraint. Taking a page from modern birds of prey, this attack plan was for the dromaeosaur to jump on the back of its prey, of a similar size or smaller, dig its foot claws in, pin the animal below its weight, and then rip the victim to shreds with its teeth. Oh, and they would have had to flap their wings for stability while the prey atom struggled. That's how paleontologists now think they killed. Maybe Velociraptor used both methods? Unfortunately, we haven't sent a camera crew to the Cretaceous to find out. Lastly, you may have read in every dinosaur book growing up that the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. Well, the extinction event was closer to 66 million years ago. So yes, everything you read is a lie. This is where we get to the problem problem, stuff I'll actually lower the grade for. Again, there's not too much to complain about. Like in Chased by Dinosaurs, Tarbosaurus and Velociraptor are shown living in the same community. This wasn't the case, as the raptor lived and died before Tarbo appeared on the scene 70 million years ago. Protoceratops from the same segment didn't get a compliment when I went over these depictions. I can't tell for short, but it looks recycled from Chased by Dinosaurs. Recycle! I wasn't in love with them then, I'm not in love now. Once again, the BBC gets the tail all wrong. Protoceratops had a taller, longer tail, not a small and flimsy one like its larger relatives. Unfortunately, their predator, Velociraptor, is shown using coordinated pack hunting strategies. So I guess even in a show about testing common dinosaur myths, no one decided to question pack hunting because it's just too cool I guess. I mean, I know there are a few examples of modern archosaurs hunting together, so why not just assume all raptors did it, even though it's certainly the exception today and not the rule? There is no fossil evidence of velociraptor hunting in packs. Nothing. Zilch. Nada. Maybe you could make the argument for Deinonychus and Utah Raptor with several individuals found buried together, but there are other perfectly reasonable explanations such as a feeding frenzy or flash flooding. Heck, they may have hunted together in loose organized gangs like Komodo dragons, but as for a pack lifestyle, this is not supported. In fact, chemical analysis of Deinonychus teeth showed that juveniles and adults weren't eating the same food something you'd expect out of a tightly knit social structure. While I'm on the topic of dromaeosaurs, the Killing Claw segment is primarily focused on Velociraptor, but even in scenes when this genus is being referred to, footage of its cousin Deinonychus appears with no distinction being made. Some audiences may not be familiar with their differences, so the documentary should clarify when they're talking about either one. One part that annoys me is when Tyrannosaurus is called dumb because the shape of its brain is more similar to alligators than to birds. This doesn't make them stupid, impulsive beasts. Actually, T-Rex is credited as one of the smartest dinosaurs to have ever lived. 
Maybe it couldn't solve math problems, but this animal had amazing senses of smell, hearing, and vision. Plus, Tyrannosauroids began as small and nimble predators. They already had their big brains when they became large apex predators. And although I have ragged on this idea a lot, there is a possibility, possibility, that the closely related Tyrannosaurids, Albertosaurus, Despletosaurus, and Teratophonius were social animals. There's not evidence for this in T-Rex, but its relatives could have had social skills, more so than me for sure. So no, Tyrannosaurus wasn't dumb. Especially not by dinosaur standards. Check out the big brain on Brad! You a smart mother- Finally, my last nitpick, and this is the nitpick, is the T-Rex's skull. It's pretty wonky in scenes with a CGI skeleton. The holes in the head, or fenestrae, look wrong. The anorbital fenestra is tiny, and along with the promaxillary fenestra, is squished towards the orbit where the eyes would be. These holes should extend down the snout towards the nose. The naris, or big nostril hole, is also looking weak. These problems only get exacerbated when actual wreck skulls are shown, and the metal bone crusher looks more accurate. And yeah, this also happens with Velociraptor. Man, this has been a good time. Yeah, there's some wonky editing, and the host is strange, but the truth about killer dinosaurs isn't afraid to bring the truth about killer dinosaurs. Finally, a dinosaur documentary that isn't afraid to bust these all too common myths. We don't get perfection, but we're getting there. The BBC gave us a fact-based show that is more interested in educating audiences than just looking cool, so I'm gonna have to give it a commendable A-. Well, now we know the truth about killer dinosaurs. Next time, we're gonna finish the Walking With Trilogy with Walking With Monsters. And remember, if you enjoyed this episode, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.